What if your grandparents had just barely escaped a genocide that left up to 1.5 million people dead just because they shared your faith and ethnic background? And what if that genocide had then been forgotten? We'll hear survivor testimonies, and I'll get a little personal next. They went to the house of Father Yordanus Fafiatis. They took all of his possessions. They brought the priest and his wife, Rebecca, a 30-year-old young woman, his three children, and the priest's mother out into the street. They tied up Father Yordanus, raped his wife in front of the children, and then butchered all of them. The other priest of Lefkis, Father Kosti, along with his wife and two children, was butchered by the executioner with his knife. Eleni Fafiatis, May 1921. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Now number one in podcasting, thanks to loyal listeners like you. I'm going to return again to a personal topic from my family tree, and that's the genocide of the Greek population on the west coast of Asia Minor, today's Turkey. It's there that my father's parents, my grandparents Agiros Somali and Dimitri Karyanis, were lucky to escape with their lives and the clothes on their backs. Between 1914 and 1923, the Islamic Ottoman Empire, which stretched from the southern tip of Europe all the way down through what's today Israel, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, and both shores of Saudi Arabia, carried out a systematic and violent campaign of extermination, targeting its native Christian Greek citizens, as well as the Armenian citizens who you may be more familiar with. The Ottomans had cast their lot with Germany and the Central Powers, and came out on the losing end of World War I, which is why their empire ultimately crumbled. The core of the country that was left feared their minority populations. The Christians had few allies in a world exhausted by years of fighting. So the Ottomans took the opportunity to erase ancient Greek communities on the southern shore of the Black Sea, those are known as the Pontian Greeks, who had lived across the water from Crimea for literally centuries. The Turks burned them out of existence and did the same to those communities all along the lush eastern Mediterranean coast. And yet today, partly because the Greek government itself doesn't talk much about the expulsion and genocide, and because of the Turkish government's century-long denials, it's as if the 1.5 million Greeks who were slaughtered, and the mass of refugees who were expelled from the only homeland they'd ever known, never existed. We'll be speaking with Greek-Australian Aris Silphidis, who brings us the genocide of the Greeks in Turkey. Survivor Testimonies from the Nicomedia Massacres of 1920 to 1921. It's the very first English translation of journalist Kostas Feltate's reports and interviews published in 1921 under the title, These Are the Turks, Survivor Testimonies from the Nicomedia Massacre. Like Mayaya Adiro, who I just mentioned, Kostas was born in Smyrna, renamed Izmir by the same cabal that changed Constantinople to Istanbul. Faltate's book is an example of journalism being that first draft of history. He recorded the rampages of forces loyal to Mustafa Kemal, called Ataturk, or Father of the Turks, documenting graphic first-hand accounts of the atrocities that left millions dead, Greeks, Armenians, and other Christians, in a search for living space that foreshadowed Adolf Hitler's goal of slaughtering the Slavs to gain Lebensraum. In Kemal's case, it was seeking to build a Turkey for the Turks, at the expense of people who had lived there for countless generations. Aris Silphidis is a practicing pharmacist in Melbourne, Australia. He administers the Greek Genocide Resource Center at greek-genocide.net. It's an online portal containing bibliography, photos, testimonies, and other documentation 
of what's known as the 20th century's first genocide. Okay, now that we've arrived with journalist Kostas Valtates in the heat of the war to expel Asia Minor's Christian communities, let's join Aris Sulfidis on Australia's southern coast and bear solemn witness to the genocide of the Greeks in Turkey. I'm joined on the line from Melbourne, Australia, by Aris Silphidis. He brings us The Genocide of the Greeks in Turkey, Survivor Testimonies from the Nicomedia Massacres of 1920-1921. Thank you, Aris, for making the time to discuss your important work with the History Author Show. Thanks for the opportunity to be with you, Dean. Well, some books come across my desk, or in your case, emails come across my email box, and I feel I owe it to the people that survived this to do that interview, to do what I can to spread the word about that book. One of those books was called Lola's House, about the Filipino women that were forced into sexual slavery, the so-called comfort women, by the Japanese Empire during World War II. And I said, well, gosh, I, as much as I love my novelists and people like that, if I'm going to do a history show, it's certainly going to be for something like a group of people, a group of women in that case, that were still waiting for an apology, still waiting for descendants of the Japanese soldiers that did these things to admit what they had done in the Second World War. The genocide of the Greeks in Turkey, as regular listeners know, that has a connection to me and my family. So I certainly had to pick up your book. We had first connected through the Greek Genocide Resource Center when I needed some help identifying some photographs from my Yaya Adiro, my grandmother, my father's mother. Those traced back to the period of your book, the period of the genocide, which she escaped as a young girl, just in her early teens. So start with your journey to memorializing this period in history. You're a pharmacist by trade and by training, and here you're all the way in Melbourne, Australia in the 21st century. You're a century removed in time and you're many, many thousands of miles removed in space from the events that happened during this genocide. How did you come to have this as part of your destiny, the mission we find at Greek-Genocide.net, the Greek Genocide Resource Center? Yes, my connection and my inspiration was my grandfather, similar to yourself. I decided to interview him, like a formal interview, in 1996. I was in my mid-20s at the time, and I just wanted to get an idea. He told me that he was born in Turkey, as it was known today, but in the Ottoman Empire in 1915. And I was just trying to get an understanding of his life as a Christian, as a Greek, within a Turkish empire, as you would call it. Through the process, he told me that he and the surrounding villages, there were people around there that hid up on a mountain for two and a half years. And I just couldn't understand why. And he said it in such a casual way where I just couldn't understand how he could experience that. And it wasn't until later, after having traveled to Greece the year later and purchasing a book and reading about exactly what he told me in a Greek book, that I realized that what he experienced was an act of extreme persecution and genocide. So because there was nothing in English at the time, I thought to myself, well, I was inquisitive and I was very curious to learn more about the history of that period. And I thought to myself, well, I'll gather as much information as possible. And over the last 20 to 25 years, I've been gathering all that information. I decided to put it in the form of a website, which is information that's freely available so that people like yourself and anyone else that's researching that period can freely access and learn more about that period. And you must hear from people all over the world who've been cast to the wind by this act of genocide and earthquakes and the various trouble that has gone through Greece over the years. Greeks have always been a people who traveled and have spread far and wide. In fact, there's a gentleman named Dean Carianis down in Chile, and I, I refer to him sometimes uh, among my friends and family as Chilean Dean. I had somebody contact me one day looking for him, and Carianis is a very rare name. That's a name that marks me, for lack of a better word, as somebody coming from this region where your grandfather came from, from the Asia Minor, not somebody who's from the mainland Greek that most people probably think of when they look at a map and need to point at where Greece is. For you, when you start something like this, like the Greek Genocide Resource Center, 
I imagine that you wonder if anybody's going to click on it. And then by the time you've had it up for a month or two months or a few years, you hear from people all over the world who are asking you to give what help you can. And I could say from my personal experience, when I sent you a couple of photographs from my grandmother, that you freely offered it. You were so helpful and so prompt. I felt a little bit bad because you jumped right on it. And I said, yeah, you can take your time, but you were so helpful. You must hear from people all over. And how do you decide that? How do you not let that mission take over your regular daily life? Or is it just something you still enjoy and tribute to your grandfather? When there's something you really have a passion for, you do find the time regardless of what's going around in your life. For me, it's just become part of my life now. I spend one or two hours every morning reading about whatever I can on the genocide. And with that part of history, one thing leads to another. So you read one source of information and you learn something that somebody said and you thought, well, you know, you try and find more information. So it's just become a continuation of uh, something that started small. And as you said, with the website, we decided to put it out on social media and the support we're getting from social media media has been our our gauge of um, how important this is. And we've developed a huge following on social media, especially Facebook. So that's our gauge to, or my gauge to continue what I'm doing is the response I get from the public, which like yourself, I just, I've met people from all walks of life that were affected by this event. People can find you on Facebook and they have that little stat there about your responsiveness. And I see just how responsive you are there on Facebook and people can follow you there. They could see things like news stories that you post of things that are happening in various parts of the world. When I speak about people being all over the world, they could connect and be together, even though it's a diaspora and people are all around the globe in different countries speaking different languages. Look how far we're speaking today and and finding something in common. It's really a community that can then mobilize around something like your book and spread the word and hear me with my little show uh, all the way around in America. I can feel a connection to it and hopefully tell people about it. Yeah. The response, as I said, has been massive. We get people that were affected in directly, indirectly. There's a lot of genealogy websites and Facebook pages where a lot of Greeks had connections to the Ottoman Empire. In fact, one of the most common inquiries I get through emails is I'm trying to find my ancestors. And there's been an almost, it's almost like as a result of the genocide, the whole history of that period just stopped. And people lost people either through deaths, through deportations, but the refugees and the survivors were scattered all over the world. And as a result of this event, there are so many people looking for their ancestors where And unfortunately, I can't respond to all the emails. Sometimes I physically find it difficult to actually tell people, I'm sorry, but I can't help you. But I do as much as I can. There are some refugee lists which are available, luckily. And a lot of people I've put in, I basically direct them to some of the refugees that arrived in Greece, which are very helpful to people that are helping, looking for their ancestors. So, yeah, it's a challenge running the website and the Facebook page, but I, I really enjoy it. So I really find that there's there's so many different uh, avenues to the Asia Minor story and the genocide. So I try and make it as interesting as possible. It has to be very rewarding because you're helping people to take the first step, even if you're not going to be able to go and do what my wife does, for instance, did for me and my family and track down some of these pieces that have been left broken across the historical record, you can at least get people asking. And from my experience, as I discussed with Lou Urenic when we discussed his book, Smyrna, The Great Fire, about the genocide of 1920-21, Many people just don't ask. And for me, when my wife, being Irish Canadian and able to trace her birth back all the way before the time of Christ, she could trace it back on some of those lines. You hit royalty and it just goes back and back. Every Greek person, people in my family said, there's nothing to find. It was just a very quick, brusque response just because of that generational trauma that Professor Urenic and I talked about because things were burned, people were killed, and you just believe that it's just a shut door and you're going to move on. And there are things out there to find. So I think it's great that people can look around and they may not be really much more than a little culturally Greek. And they can look, find the Greek Genocide Resource Center. They could find a book like The Genocide of the Greeks in Turkey and start to ask those questions. 
And if not for you here, this record would not be available to English speakers. So I think that's a great thing. You go and you you find Costas Faltate's book and you bring it to us here as the genocide of the Greeks in Turkey. It's a shocking read. It's not something that's it's not something that's just a lark that you read quickly before bed. It's a book that when first published in 1921, it was pretty shocking, wasn't it? And I wanted to ask you, how did the world react? Here's a journalist. He goes there. He starts to interview people about these horrors that they've witnessed firsthand. How does the world react, first in Greece and then the wider world? Yeah, in Greece, there were reports coming into the Greek media about what was happening. And I think that was an attempt by another reason why Costas Faltates, the author of our book, wanted to publish these immediately after returning from Asia Minor in late 1921. So there was shock and horror what was happening, but the Greek public already knew about it. And there were calls to have this book translated to many other languages for that reason, because his book was only in Greek. And although they did translate it to French immediately at the time, because French was the common language used at the time during conferences, peace conferences and so on, they immediately translated to French, but it was never done to English. Now, the reason we did it to English, because it's 100 years later. And as I said, there are so many people want to know what happened. In terms of response overseas, the American response to the genocide was enormous. The Near East Foundation, which operates today, actually formed in 1915 and was originally called the American Committee for Armenian and Syrian Relief. And it actually formed in direct response to the Armenian genocide that was happening in Ottoman Turkey. And there was actually another American organization who was affiliated to the Near East Committee I just mentioned. It was called the Greek Relief Committee. They both shared their offices in a building in New York. And what they did was provide relief to the survivors of the genocide that was happening during the First World War. Now, on the board of trustees on the Greek Relief Committee was not only the former ambassador to Turkey or the current one at the time, Henry Morgenthau, but also Abraham Kazan, who was the uncle of the famous Greek-American film director, Alia Kazan, who directed the film Streetcar Named Desire. There were a lot of prominent Americans that were joining these organisations to provide relief to the survivors. And I'll just mention another important one, or one of that most people may be aware of, is Jackie Coogan, who most people may know him as Uncle Fester in the Adams Family. Yeah, crazy connection. Yeah, so in 1921, at, at the age of six, the Near East Relief used him as their, I suppose, their poster boy to get the word out there. Now, he was touched by the suffering of the orphans. And he led a huge humanitarian mission throughout the USA where he gathered uh, bundles of clothing. He asked for people to donate money. He visited various towns throughout the USA. And not only that, but he personally delivered this relief material to Athens following the genocide to the, to the Greek government. He actually stopped off in Rome and he received the blessing of the Pope. So this was the, the effort, the lengths that Americans were going to to provide relief to the sufferers of what was happening in Ottoman Turkey at the time, in which the American public and even, even the Australian public, they donated shiploads of goods, flour, food, clothing. So there was a huge response in terms of, of what happened. The Genocide of the Greeks in Turkey is a book of survivor testimonies. So I've asked you to select a couple for listeners that you'd like to read for us. So set up this by giving us the name of the person that Faltates interviewed and read it for us, give us a little bit of their recollection. Sure. So um, the first one is by the proprietor of a hotel in Adda Bazaar, and he interviewed the proprietor. His name was, he was an Armenian by the name of Benjamin Lazian. Interestingly, Benjamin says that his wife was German, so the Kemalists didn't deport him or kill him during the Armenian Genocide. So he managed to escape because of his affiliation to the Germans, who the, um, the Ottoman authorities were very, and the Kemalist authorities felt was excused from um, massacre. But anyway, he goes on to say, to describe one of the prime perpetrators mentioned in the book, a man by the name of Gavur Ali. And this is what he says of him. He would slaughter men by hacking their legs into pieces to their navels. He would kill women by slicing open their stomachs and the children he would drag in packs towards bridges. There he would shatter their skulls against the deck of the bridge and toss them into the water. 
When he passed through streets of Adabazar, houses would close shut, Christians would hide and nobody would dare look him in the eye. Such was the brutality of his stare. All the Turkish officers and the other Kemalist leaders, guerrilla fighters, civil servants, scholars and hodges had plenty of money to spend, money which they'd grabbed from the Christians they'd stolen from. But Gavur Ali outdid them all. He would count his gold lira by the barrel full. He had amassed so much money and built so much power through his band of guerrilla fighters that the Kemalist leaders here were beginning to fear him. So they decided to take measures to rid themselves of his clout and in the process seize all his wealth. And Benjamin goes on to describe the um, an incident where Gavur Ali was finally arrested and taken to be imprisoned. And he said the following, and this is Gavur Ali speaking, I've slaughtered thousands of Christians from my country. I've burnt villages and towns. I've done so many other good things and you imprison me? Take 10,000 lira, take 100,000 lira and let me go. It is an offence to Allah if you hang me in front of Christians. So that's just one example of um, one of the prime perpetrators. I can give you just one more, if you like, testimony by Christos Kalansis, who was from a village called Funduklia. There were 2,500 Greeks in this village. Only half survived, according to Chris Kalansis. And it happened when the Kemalist regular forces encircled the village. There was a man by the name of Haji Bey, he pretended to offer them protection if they gave him all their farm animals and large amounts of money. Some of them did this, but it didn't work. So obviously he just took all their wealth. Some fled. Christos was caught, put in a church and then released. The women were locked up in the school. And he says the following, and this is Christos Kalansis speaking. They put us back in the church. They took all our clothes, leaving us barefoot and only our underpants and undershirts, and then led us in a line toward the school. The Turks had selected the prettiest young women the first night in the school and raped them in front of their mothers. They selected females from the ages of 10 and over and made the young ones hold candles to illuminate them. The girls did not want to be raped and preferred to die, but the mothers told them, go, go my child, so they don't kill you. But the Turks raped the women and girls and then slaughtered them by torturing them heinously, the sound of their screams filling the entire village. So these are just some of the scenes which are described in the book, which not only did they happen 100 years ago, but I think you'll find that these happened only recently in Iraq and Syria with ISIS. So that these things are happening again and again. So history repeats, as, as they say. You mentioned that Greece saw to it that Valtate's accounts were translated into the diplomatic language, French. At the time, France is openly pro-Ottoman and anti-Greek. The newspaper Chronica wrote, quote, it must be translated into all the languages and circulated everywhere, specifically in countries that are in favor of the Turks. And in that case, they mean the Ottoman Turks, what they're doing at that time, the Kamalists. So why did it fall to you 100 years later, a pharmacist in Melbourne, Australia, to share this book with the English-speaking world? What happened that interrupted the translation of this book, especially since, as you just said, there was real interest in what was happening in the English-speaking world? We just translated the book by chance. So I, I purchased this book on eBay in 2010, uh, I had no idea of its contents, and as we went along and got to um, meet the family, so the, the author's son runs a museum on the island of Skyros in Greece. So when I purchased the book, there were four pages missing. So before we could translate it, and by the way, my co-translator and the lady who did most of the work is a Greek-American by the name of Eleni Fufus, who had contacted me almost at the same time as me purchasing the book and emailed to me through my website and said, look, if you need any help, <laughs> I'm... yeah, so everything happened by chance. Um, and she said that she can translate and it all, it all just came together. We, we got the four missing pages from the museum. We got the blessing of uh, Manos Faltates, who is the author's son. And then we got to meet Anna Faltates, who is the author's granddaughter. And through the whole process, we learned about what a prolific writer the author was. We had no idea we were translating a book that at the time was being called for. So it was all, everything just happened by chance. They didn't make any progress at the time? Was there just too much going on after the Great War? Because I'm curious why 
here you have a newspaper calling for it. Couldn't they have gotten somebody at the time to translate it? Or do you just not know why it just stayed in French and Greek and kind of got lost to the English-speaking world? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, at the time, there were a lot of peace conferences that were going on following the war, uh, and I mean the Greco-Turkish war. According to the family, the book was presented through the Greek government, produced the book to um, some of these peace conferences to influence their opinions at the time. So as for why it didn't get translated, I think possibly, and I'm guessing here, that the Greek government had lost any hope that they could influence the French or whoever was at these peace conferences. I'm guessing things happen pretty quickly uh, and decisions are made very quickly. And they probably decided that translating it to English at the time wouldn't have influenced the decision makers. I'd say that's probably why. And I guess there were, from reading Lou Urenik's book, English journalists that would have been there that would have been reporting some of this back home. So this would have been that first draft of history, really, because these are first person accounts. And usually that's not what you put under your byline, right? Here, Faltates as a journalist is taking the time to go and speak to people, but he's not writing a column just on his own. It's just him recording this, I guess, for posterity. And here we are, you and I, we're part of that posterity. So I I guess that that makes sense. But it just surprised me that when you have people at the time calling for it to be translated, that it takes 100 years. But then again, I get many books like that that come across my desk that they've just sat there, maybe even a diary that's in English. And people just leave it there and nobody thinks to make a book out of it for modern readers or to translate it or to break it down. So I should thank you on behalf of all these people who can read it in English now. You can apply it to your own story. Yeah, I think um, with the book, uh, it's not only a book of testimonies. We we actually tried to find a historian that could um, write a, a prologue and we found um, a German historian by the name of Dr. Tessa Hoffman who has written extensively on the Armenian genocide And we asked her to read the book for a start and if she could write a prologue. And the book contains her prologue, which puts it all together in terms of the historical events, what was happening in the book. To us, it was just a book of, as you said, horrifying testimonies. There are eight testimonies in the book which speak of terrible atrocities being committed on the Greeks in the region. We were motivated to get that out. But when when it's put all put together, by a historian, and then you start to realise what was happening in the region in terms of some of the Allies being occupying Constantinople, the French were occupying southeast of Turkey, you had the Italians occupying the southwest, you had the Greek occupation which sparked all this. Uh, And so it gave us more of an understanding, and I think it will give readers an understanding as to why these atrocities occur. And it's worth mentioning that not only did Turks or Kemalists in this instance commit atrocities on Greeks, but there were also atrocities being committed by the average Greek in that region who had suffered extensively during the war, had lost their families and they were all of their assets were taken from them. They were deported to the interior and treated horribly during the first phase of the genocide. And some of these Greeks and Armenians decided to take retribution on the local Turks in the region. So retributive atrocities, we don't hide the fact that they occur in the region, but when you read the historian's prologue, it puts it all into context in, in terms of why they occurred. And to us, as I said, it's it's more than just a book of testimonies. It's a, it's a piece of history which is put into context by the historian and should give people a good understanding of what they may have heard about that period, but not by a professional say, historian, and by a first-hand account, as it's in the book. You mentioned Dr. Tessa Hoffman. She's scholar of Armenian studies and sociology at the Free University of Berlin. She writes in her prologue to the genocide of the Greeks in Turkey of overkill during massacres and, quote, extraordinary cruelty that by far exceeds any tactical necessity of simply eliminating an enemy, unquote. The perpetrators and their heirs often dismiss the genocide as what happens in war. And you mentioned just a moment ago about 
not denying the fact that there were retributive attacks and that this was a war that gets very much out of hand, as unfortunately wars often do. Genocide doesn't start just in a moment. Everyone gets up from dinner and decides that they're going to push somebody off the land and that they're going to have a war. These things do rise from that. But the difference is that the Greeks are not denying the things that happened there. You just offered it here to us. And yet the Turkish government, a succession of them, have denied that genocide. If we've heard anything about this kind of thing, we've probably heard about the Armenian genocides. We know about Holocaust deniers. It's important for us to take this tone of saying, this is a moment of history. This is something that happened that was an atrocity. These victims, even though we may feel more of a connection to them than we do to the comfort women in the Philippines from World War II, I'd like to think that I would still care about this book if somebody sent it to me and said, oh, hey, there were a million people that were murdered by X group and these people suffered and that to this day, there's not a full accounting, therefore not a full healing. So you have people who are the heirs on both sides, unable to put that generational trauma behind them, the guilt and maybe and the shame and just the ignorance of it and then the pain of it. And I think that's so important. So I like that you had that in the beginning by Dr. Hoffman because she could put that in some kind of perspective. So I wondered if you'd give us some examples from Faltate's reporting, from his writing down of these first-person accounts of the kind of atrocities we're talking about taking place during this period. And if you want to give us a sample of them on both sides, something that maybe happened that was then repeated in somebody who was seeking retribution for the torture and murder of their family, feel free to do that. I want this to be as broad a conversation as possible. This is about humanity and the depths that humanity can fall. So go ahead, give us a brief sketch here. Some of the stories we'll be reading in those eight testimonials. Yeah, so the, as Tessa um, described them as overkill, so in that region, they weren't just killing Greeks, but th there was what Tessa described as overkill. So basically, I can give you a couple of examples, a couple of examples, if you like. For instance, a man who had his teeth threaded around his neck. Um, so they not only killed him, but they threaded his teeth around his neck. Another example is, let's say, an elderly lady of 85 years of age who was crucified and nailed outside the door of her house with her eyes hanging out. Um, they're both examples of where there's no need to crucify someone or have their teeth tied around their neck. It's part of a process, I think, of dehumanising these people. As for trying to explain it, I'll try and explain it in this way. The genocide of the Greeks, as opposed to the genocide of Armenians, with the Armenians, they were virtually wiped out within a year. With the Greeks, it was what Tessa describes as a cumulative genocide. So it happened. It started just before the war, around 1912-13. Uh, it gained momentum during the war. And a lot of the people that, as, as we mentioned, the retributive atrocities, suffered extensively during the war and lost everything, found an opportunity to obviously take a bit of retribution. In terms of why the Kemalists or why some of these perpetrators committed these acts of overkill, as mentioned before, the Ottoman Empire was crumbling and the allies, the victorious, victorious allies had occupied Constantinople, or Istanbul as we know it, and certain sections were being promised to all these other countries. And the Kemalists thought, right, so we're in danger here. The only way we can take back land, what they did is they released a lot of prisoners from prison, so ex-criminals, hardened criminals, and they gave them a license to kill. Basically, they, they just said to them, do as you wish, because they felt as though this was their last opportunity to take back their land. And to do that is to get rid of the Christians that were still on the land, which Greece was fighting for. There was a, still a large amount of Christians there. And they were motivated by religious hatred. And there was a fear within the, the, the Kemalists that their nation was about to virtually disappear. That's the, the only way I can describe the overkill aspect of it. But it was just a genocide of, it was cumulative. It, it started slowly, it built up, there were deportations and people that suffered in the end thought that they were being uh, liberated by the Hellenic army. But in the end, the Kemalists decided, well, we're just going to do away with whatever's left. One atrocity that stuck in my mind from Lou Yurenik's book, English speakers probably very well know the Suvlaki, the sticking the stick through and 
cooking the lamb over the fire in the in the yard. I was going to say that's usually where you do it, half an oil drum or something, suvla's stick, right? And so he said that's how one of the ways that they would torture you to kill you. And they would do that same thing to a human being. They would stick it in one end and out your neck. And so I said to him, well, I don't think I'm going to ever look at Suvlaki the same way again. I like what Dr. Hoffman said about this being something that is a warning from history, that this is about humanity, because this may be the first time many listeners are hearing about this mass slaughter. In the U.S., we do hear about the Armenian genocide a little bit. We hear about the Holocaust, of course, during World War II, Cambodia's killing fields, Rwanda more recently. We hear about these things, but we don't hear much about the Hellenic experience, which is a little surprising to me because Greek people have no trouble making themselves heard. So I don't know exactly why that is, but I wanted to ask you from an Australian perspective there in Melbourne, and you mentioned a Greek radio station. My ears kind of perked up that there's that much of a population there, even though I know there are many Greeks in Australia. In fact, in my cookbook here, Regional Greek Cooking, I have some Australian recipes in there from when I went to Australia and met some Greek restaurateurs who were nice enough to submit recipes to me. So how was the feeling for that in Australia? Is this more well known there? No, I think in America and Australia, the the way that they see the genocide is, um, put it this way, the, the majority of Greeks nowadays weren't affected, were not directly affected by the genocide. So unfortunately, they don't feel an emotional connection. I think in, if you are going to try to bring something to the public's attention, you really need to be motivated by a personal and an emotional connection. Unfortunately, the majority of the Greeks, even though they're aware of what happened, do not have the emotional connection. It's left to all these, I guess you can call them refugee groups, which have formed after the genocide, the genocide surviving groups, which many of them have formed, but they're not really able to present the genocide in a proper way. The Armenians are a lot more organised in that regard because the Armenian nation was formed as a result of the genocide. So there's nearly all Armenians were directly affected by the genocide and they have a very strong emotional connection to what happened. And that's why I think a lot more people in the USA and worldwide are aware of the um, Armenian genocide. In Australia, it's very fragmented. There are attempts currently to broaden the awareness along with the Armenian and Assyrian communities, and I believe that's happening in the USA as well. And it's unfortunate that the Greeks haven't been able to do this, and I think part of the reason is because the Greek government, they don't consider this a big... Uh, they, I'm not sure if they... I'm not sure what motivates them to keep quiet about it, even though if you think about it, 1.2 million genocide survivors arrived in Greece in 1923, reshaping the demographics of modern Greece. It's hard to understand why the Greek government doesn't reference this in, in a lot of their um, public speeches when, when dealing with Turkey. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a bit of apathy there with the, with the um, collectively with Greeks. But I believe that that could be changing, hopefully, so that we can get the word out that what Greeks did suffer was genocide. Important thing to mention, too, for listeners is that there is a division between people who came from Asia Minor. I mentioned at the beginning that you look at that map and you say, OK, you're from there. There's not that sense in this period. There's a sense of you were from Turkey, you're here now. And it reminds me of an example people may know better, and that's from Martin Fletcher's book, Promised Land. He wrote a novel of the beginning of Israel, first of three novels about its formation and then the life of Israel up to the present day. They're not just all Jewish, as maybe we think of the Jewish state today. Jewish people that come from Germany, they're looking down on Jewish people that have no common language with them, that are coming from places like Egypt and all around the world to try to form a new country without even a common language. And I know, for instance, my grandmother could speak Turkish because she was raised there. So she was bilingual, but she wouldn't speak it after she came here or around other Greek people. For my mother, my mother's family was from Cyprus. Her parents were from northern Cyprus. So sometimes people would give her a hard time about the way that the Cypriots spoke Greek. I guess it's not different from when I was in Australia, for instance. My friend who was from Perth was considered quite different, and they gave him a little bit of ribbing when we were up in Queensland. 
So that's maybe part of the reason it clicked in my head when you said that the Armenians are one nation and that they all suffered. It's not a shared experience for every Greek person that somebody might know. In fact, there may be some English-speaking listeners here who are Irish or they're German or Norwegian or Mexican or from anywhere in the world, and they'll say to a Greek friend of theirs, hey, I just heard about the Greek genocide. A person who's from Macedonia or maybe from Crete or something, they may have no physical connection to this. So that makes sense what you're saying, that that may be one reason why we just don't hear about it. Even though the Greek people have a nation state, it's not a focus of everybody there. They have other past experiences in their families. Yeah, unfortunately, that's the way it is with the Greek experience is that a lot of the Greeks that arrived in Greece, for a start, a lot of them were discriminated against because the, a lot of them, well, they were Ottoman citizens. A lot of them could only speak Turkish. Yeah. There was this us and them with the refugees that were arriving, and it took them a long time to assimilate into Greek society. And I think some of the refugees, now they've, they've split up into effectively three groups. You have the East Thracians, you have Asia Minor Greeks, and then you have the Pontic Greeks. And I mean, even nowadays, we learn of the Levantine Greeks who have even created their own groups calling for recognition. And they differed in terms of ethno-culturally. They they had slightly different culturally. Some of them spoke differently. And I think they they didn't feel as though they were part of the Greek state when they they arrived. And they formed their own individual, just so they they can keep relevant to themselves. And they felt felt more comfortable. And these things have continued on. Unfortunately, with the Greeks, we don't have one day of recognition, for instance, like the Armenians do. We have three days of recognition based on regions. There's a couple of issues there with, and that all projects to the public. You know, some people call it the Thracian genocide, others others call it the Asia Minor genocide, and that we get all these different mixture of ways in which the genocide is portrayed to the public. And we don't have this common single defining the genocide as one event. And I think that's where we, in a way, we become our own worst enemies. But I think that will also change as people start to understand. It's all about education. And this is all part of what I'm trying to do with the Greek Genocide Resource Centre is to get people to understand that all the victims were Greeks. They all suffered the same way in diff- you know, different periods. And there's no, really no reason to be divided based on those, that criteria. You mentioned being divided, and I thought to myself that we have a word for that in English. We call it balkanized. And, whoa, what's right there at the bottom of the Balkan Peninsula but is Greece. So there you go. That's a perfect example of the divisions that we think of within areas that we make in a nice clean blue or pink blob on the map with clear borders. That's not necessarily how the feeling is within a nation like Greece, like Spain is similar that way. These aren't just drawn instantly as one nation. And people will tend to identify very much from their island or their town or where they're from. And you look at the maps of Greece changing over time of different empires. And that struck me here very much. And I also thought of something like East Germany. You think about East Germany trying to bring all those people in, even though they were all Germans, they're bringing in people who had no experience. They had no money in the case of these Greeks that are being cast out of Turkey. Everything would have been taken from them at the border. Similar to the story, as I said, being thrown out as if you were Jewish and lucky enough to get out of Nazi Germany, you often had nothing but the clothes on your back. At the time we're recording this, we're worried about a similar refugee situation in Korea. If North Korea were to fall apart, it would be an incredible flood of humanity that had no means of taking care of themselves, that had been just crushed. They had no skills. They had been taking care of the state all that time. So even though South Koreans would look at them as fellow Koreans, they're so fundamentally different that it would be a real hard try. So these are all things I think that that idea that I had of trying to make everybody feel a little invested in your stories that these people are telling their experiences. I think whoever you are, you could find something to latch onto and understand how these people were cast to the wind and why it's maybe something they're hearing about for the first time now. Yeah. And I think the important thing here is the psychological um, aspect of genocide. So a lot of these people were traumatized. They they had suffered 10 years of um, persecution and they arrived in a country that was completely foreign to them in Greece. They faced all sorts of, um, I mean, my grandfather, who I interviewed, he was such a quiet man. 
he would rarely speak. And I often wondered whether he was emotionally scarred by what he experienced. And in fact, I'm pretty sure that he was. He was a devout Christian. And I think for him to witness what he went through, as much as he used to smile and, and so on, I think we have to understand the psychological impact of genocide. Genocide itself brings on so many flow on things that can last for, for decades and um, generations. I mean, even me, the, the reason that I'm writing about this 100 years later, and I get so many emails from people that are still affected by this, it's a flow on effect. And that's why we should work towards preventing genocide. And I think the only way we can do that is by learning about it. So that's partly why we published the book as well. So I think if the public can read what people suffer during genocide, and, and hopefully we can work towards preventing it, we won't have all this flow on effect of people being totally lost in terms of their, their roots and, you know, having to be uprooted to other countries. It's happening today, as you mentioned, all over the world. And I think genocide is one thing um, that we should all work towards preventing. You're listening to my conversation from New York City all the way down to Melbourne, Australia with Aris Silfidis. He's on the other side of the globe. He's 10,354 miles away. I did the calculation quickly on Google. I was glad it wasn't the old days. I'd have to run a tape measure around a globe. That's 16,663 kilometers. And that's how far we've been cast apart and yet brought together here by his work at the Greek Genocide Resource Center, which you can find at greek-genocide.net. And also we've been brought together through the stories in his book, The Genocide of the Greeks in Turkey, Survivor Testimonies from the Nicomedia Massacres of 1920-1921. Thea Halo is the author of Not Even My Name. It's an account of her mother Sanos' experience in the slaughter before and after the Great War. She writes of Aris's translation, quote, the accounts by Greek survivors in the genocide of the Greeks in Turkey, of massacres, torture, rape, theft, and the destruction of villages, and the brutalizer's sheer pleasure in inflicting such suffering on fellow humans, attests to the depths to which humans are capable of descending. Aris, like Thea Hallo, I kept picturing my family in these eyewitness accounts, and I found I had to occasionally put down the genocide of the Greeks in Turkey just to process what I was reading. How, as a journalist, if you got any insight from the family of Kostas Faltates, how he approached these people, like your grandfather, who you just mentioned was reticent, like my grandmother, who I just hinted at her, not wanting to speak about this, not wanting to speak about the Turks and what she'd experienced there as a young girl. How do you think he got them to open up about their experiences so that he could write them down and so that they wouldn't be forgotten? We could read them here a hundred years later. Yeah, so if we go back to his, his origins, he was actually born in Western Asia Minor in Smyrna, which is Izmir today. And at the age of two, his family decided to move to the island of Skyros in Greece. He studied um, law at the University of Athens. And while he graduated in law, he, didn't, he decided not to practice law, but to go into journalism. And so he got thrown into, uh, as a journalist, into the, the Balkan Wars. He rep reported the Bal Balkan Wars quite extensively for a number of Greek newspapers. And then he was thrown into Asia Minor in 1921 by one of the Greek newspapers, a prominent Greek newspaper called Embros. So look, there was a personal connection for him because he was born there, even though he was just a baby when he left. Now, when he arrived, and he speaks about it in the introduction to his book, he was confronted by all these people fleeing their villages being burnt down. That was the very first thing he actually saw on the ship as it was coming into the harbour. So these people were panic-stricken. They had just had their, their villages burnt down. They just experienced massacres of the type that we've touched on a little earlier. So I really don't think it would have been difficult for him. He collects testimonies from not only Greeks but Armenians I think he would have been wondering why are these people fleeing? What is going on here? So I don't think it would have been very hard for these people to open up. He was a very creative writer, but some of his, a lot of his testimonies I've checked in other sources, they do actually match up with what actually happened in that region. So I don't think there's any exaggeration. Basically, what, what was written is true. I'm very certain of that. So 
um, yeah, so basically he just arrived there and he, he thought, well, I have to take the accounts of these people. And uh, that's pretty much how it happened. The thing that struck me throughout this was that idea of a modern accounting of the apology sought by the comfort women of, I'm sure, one of these days somebody will deny what happened, what ISIS did. You look to modern Germany and you find them making amends in a way that their Japanese Axis allies did not, a way that the heirs to Germany's Ottoman allies in the Central Powers in the Great War did not. As we're speaking about it today, I'm wondering what we can do, if anything, to help to make this clear that this is something that did happen 100 years ago, that it does still matter, that the stories of these women who are not just nameless, these young girls as young as 10, they deserve to be remembered. They deserve not to be ignored, not to pretend that it never happened. And I find that even the U.S., I'm sorry to say, is does not hold, does not recognize that the Armenian genocide happened. And we have this bipartisan failure to do so. We've had one candidate after another promise when they're candidates to recognize it and then when they're in office not do so. We've had both parties of Congress take over Congress to embarrass that president in power. They'll pass a resolution recognizing the Armenian genocide, but then when a president of their party is in, they will fail to do so. And so I wonder, because as I keep mentioning, I really am passionate about justice, about righting historical wrongs. The people that are in stories like the ones that you just told me, they cry out to me from history. And I want to see justice for them, not because they're Greeks, but because they're human beings. This is a thing that we see throughout history. So I'd like to figure out a way to break that cycle. One of the ways that you hold people to the real history through the Greek Genocide Research Center is recently one of those Facebook posts on that active social media account you have had something pop up in my news feed and that was the inclusion of a quote attributed to Mustafa Kemal who is known as Ataturk the father of the Turks on the Turkish Australian Friendship Memorial. Now it's not surprising I guess that fake quotes drive me nuts but this one especially jumped out at me because I see it in many places. So break down the controversy also as a way to say this is the Turkish-Australian Friendship Memorial. And I have that friend of mine from Perth, Australia, and he speaks about how if an Australian meets a Turk and they talk about Gallipoli, they do feel a friendship and a connection, which is a wonderful thing to have come out of a war. So I, I want people to be clear that we're not bashing modern people who happen to be Turks. This is an idea about setting the historical record straight. So what was that quote and what was your goal in holding the people who are putting it on there accountable? Basically, we found out about it through the Honest History group of writers in Australia who researched it. Now, I'll read the quote to you. It says, those heroes that shed their blood and lost their lives, you are now lying in the soil of a friendly country. Therefore, rest in peace. There is no difference between the Johnnies and the Mehmets to us where they lie side by side here in this country of ours. You, the mothers who sent their sons from far away countries, wipe away your tears. Your sons are now lying in our bosom and are in peace. After having lost their lives on this land, they have become our sons as well. It's a very nice quote trying to bring the two countries together because there are many Australian soldiers buried at Gallipoli and Australians visit there every year. And there are many Ottoman, not only Turks, but the Ottoman army had was, was multinational. There were different ethnicities, not just Turks buried there. So there's a common history between the two nations, and Australia considers the Gallipoli event as it's one of its most defining moments in its history, as does Turkey. There was an attempt in the 1980s for um, Turkey to create friendlier relations with the West, and they approached the Australian government and offered them this quote in order to bring friendlier relations between the two countries. There's no evidence to say that Mustafa Kemal, whose name is goes alongside the quote as being the author of it. There's no evidence, according to Australian writers and researchers, and even, even some of the Turk writers have said that there's no evidence to say that Mustafa Kemal said it. In fact, the first reference to the quote was 15 years after he died. It appears on monuments throughout Australia, and it's even quoted at ceremonies by our officials. And the fact is, you can't create friendly relations based on false quotes. Friendly relations should be based on common values. And I think in this regard, the Australians rushed to put this quote on all the monuments. 
And unfortunately now I think they're finding it a difficult situation to remove them because obviously they're set in stone. I mean, it's a very nice quote and there's nothing wrong with having friendly relations between two countries um, based on sh a shared history, but it should be done on, on facts, factual quotes and not misappropriated quotes. And I think that um, we created a, an online petition and it was signed by several hundred people here in Australia and it did gain a lot of publicity, but unfortunately, as I said, I don't think the Australian government's going to reverse it. Unfortunate, because as you mentioned, you want it to be built on the truth, and it is high-minded, but you don't have to put those little quotation marks around it that attribute to somebody who had nothing to do with it and didn't have that in him. And for me, it just struck me as shocking that they would put, that they would put that on there. The first time I saw it, before I even saw it, this monument, I had seen it somewhere else, and I'd pointed it out to somebody, and I said, go look it up, because I just knew instinctively that it didn't make any sense. I mean, I know half of my name is Yanis, which is the Johnnies that are anglicized there, that name. And I know that that wasn't the feeling at the time. Certainly nobody was feeling that everybody was equal. And it's great. It's lovely. We should feel that way. That would be very nice. But it wasn't the case. So I found that that's why it's important to learn the real history of it. And if it's not a real quote, don't don't build your house on that sand of a fake quote. Absolutely. And I think a lot during the... um in dealing with the genocide as well, there's, there are so many misappropriated photos floating around the internet. And that's one of my hates as well, is finding photos with all, all sorts of captions, which um, are quite frankly, most of the, many of them are wrong. So look, anyone can make that error with photographs, but I think we, be, we need to be very careful. And I try to be as careful as I can with photos in particular. There's a lot of even historians have got themselves into trouble with um photos during that period and even the photo I believe you sent me uh, which you didn't know there was no caption to it and uh, I remember trying to find some information for you so it, it takes a lot of time um, and quite often you won't really understand um, what that photo is especially with atrocity photos they're very hard to um, to learn about. Yeah going through my grandmother's things and finding those photographs and saying, whoa, my wife said, why does she have photos of some men that are lying dead in a ditch and some men standing over her with guns? Your instinct right away is to identify with the people that are in the ditch, right? Not the people that are that are holding the guns, but you don't know what it was in war, which I think is really bringing home what you said about realizing that this is a part of a broader conversation that we need to have as human beings because nobody wants to be the the person in the ditch and hopefully no one wants to be the scarred person who had to fire the guns. I mentioned Lou Urenic, professor of journalism at Boston University. I connected with him, interviewed him about his book, Smyrna, September 1922, The American Mission to Rescue Victims of the 20th Century's First Genocide. He suggested I ask you what about the German complicity in the killings of Christians in Asia Minor? And also, do you think the Turks distinguished in significant ways between the Greeks and the Armenians in the term of the animus and the perceived threat that you mentioned earlier about being afraid they, they might themselves lose to the Greeks? Yeah, the Ottoman Empire formed a military alliance with the Germans just prior to the start of the First World War. And German, German military officials went to Turkey to retrain and reorganize the Ottoman military. Apart from that, you had the German generals that were, they ordered the deportations of Greeks during the First World War. They supposedly were evacuations. The problem was that they were being conducted while the orders were German, by Germans. They were conducted by very cruel Turkish or Ottoman guards who quite often massacred and deported them in, in terrible conditions. By, and it was all done by the, the Ottoman authorities. So you had this joining of forces, you could say, where the Germans were ordering all these deportations, supposedly uh, for military purposes. And you had the Ottoman officials who wanted to get rid of their, especially the Greeks and Armenians, who were at the time controlled much of the trade. They were considered as a, a threat and they were considered as uh, untrustworthy because they felt that they would side with the Allies during the First World War, and they conducted these um, deportations under terrible conditions. That's the German complicity. They will deny the complicity. I don't think there's any doubt that they, they are complicit, and they will obviously allay the blame to the Ottoman uh, officials. As for the difference between Armenians and Greeks, um, as mentioned, they were both considered as untrustworthy. Um, the Turks considered... The Ottoman Turkish officials consider them 
as Turks as being subservient to the, the non-Turkish citizens, because as I said, they controlled much of the trade. Many of them were, were very wealthy and influential, and the Turks felt, well, threatened by this. And that's why they did react in the way they did against these two groups. The difference, however, is the Greeks that were living in Ottoman Turkey, even though they were Ottoman citizens, they had no connection to Greece. Greece as a nation protested some of the um, deportations and the persecutions and was able to impose some diplomatic pressure against the Ottoman officials for what they were doing to the Greeks. So the Greeks weren't as violently persecuted, say, as the Armenians were. And that's the difference. The Armenians didn't have that diplomatic pressure because there was no Armenian state. Having said that, though, the Greeks experienced persecution over a 10-year period, and the Ottoman authorities waited for opportunities to massacre and deport them, which has happened in the book. And the victim toll is very similar between the two groups, just that that happened over different periods of time. You're working on a second translation. It's the memoir of a Greek from Asia Minor who served in the armed forces of the Ottoman Empire, not only during the Great War, but in the Kemalist army while it was exterminating Christians. That sounds like an incredible story. I wanted to ask you to give us a little idea of what you're researching there. Who was this man and when can we expect to read that project? Yeah, I've um, just finished the translation. I've done this one all on my own, So, and, and the translation was from a form of Greek which is not used today. It's called Katharevusa. The Greek language didn't change dramatically, but around the 1920s, 1930s, it, it, what we use today is modern Greek. Katharevusa obviously is a lot uh, diff, more difficult to translate, but I've just completed the translation. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of um, editing and um, checking of my translation by professionals. So hopefully by next year, I'm hoping to have it done. Th this translation is the same region, general region, and it's by a pharmacist who served in the Ottoman military, not only at Gallipoli, and he, by the way, he served with distinction and he, and he received a medal for his contribution to the war effort on the side of the Ot Ottoman military. But later on, he served in the Kemalist army in the medical department. The interesting bit about this gentleman is that um, he was in contact with some of the Kemalist insiders he obviously, again, served with distinction for the Kemalists as well. But when he learned that the Kemalists wanted to burn down his town of Kuklia, where he lived, he thought, no, enough's enough. So he managed to get all his town people to leave. Now, he, he obviously shares a lot of important classified information, and he didn't release his memoirs until after he died, because apparently, according to his family, I believe he was on some sort of a... I don't know if it was a wanted list, but a lot of the uh, enemies of the Kemalists were after the um, genocide were placed on some sort of list. So I think he felt threatened that um, he, he, he didn't want to do it before he died because he felt threatened. So anyway, I've decided to get my hands on it, and um, I think it will be a very interesting read. Is the fact that he was a pharmacist the reason why you came across it and paused? Yeah, very similar to the first book in terms of everything happened by chance. Yeah, definitely, there was, there's definitely a personal connection in, in, in the fact that he's a pharmacist. The fact that he served so nobly, I think, for me, it describes the person that he was. And for me, I, I firmly believe that the majority of the Greeks of the Ottoman Empire were loyal to their, their government. For me, that's part of why I did it, in, in the fact that he was loyal to the Ottoman government yet he was still persecuted or the people around him were persecuted and he kind of stood up and um, he said enough is enough. And I think there's traits in that which I think are, uh, are really interesting. I think all of us will put up with a certain amount of something, but after a while, if sometimes we all say enough is enough. And I think that's, that's the interesting part of his story as well. Well, Aris Silfidis, thank you not only for going out of your way here to connect with me from far off Melbourne, Australia, but for giving a voice to these Gostas Faltates, went and interviewed the descendants you mentioned, his descendants there. They get to see their forefathers' work be translated into English and a whole new generation who maybe experienced or have family members who experienced these things. They can experience them now. It could be available to a wider English-speaking, English-reading audience. The genocide of the Greeks in Turkey is an important warning from the past that hopefully can inspire us all to a better tomorrow. I really 
wanted to speak with you about this book. I hope that people enjoyed hearing us speak, not just as two people who share some similar genetic background, but two people who care about history and care about making the world a better place that people can learn so nobody has to go through what our grandparents went through. So thank you so much, Aris. I hope people will check out the book. I wish you the best of luck with it and with your next project. Oh, I thank you for your time, Dean. I really do. Thank you. Again, the book is The Genocide of the Greeks in Turkey, Survivor Testimonies from the Nicomedia Massacres of 1920 to 1921. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the historyauthor.com page for this episode. My thanks to Aristophides for joining us today all the way from Melbourne, Australia, and for chronicling the voices of a dark period in history. Here in the 21st century, behind the comfort of our keyboards, it's popular to virtue signal about being true to history and to tear down historical figures. And yet it's equally common to see Ataturk praised with that fake quote we mentioned when we were talking with Aris. Or you'll hear Turkey condescendingly referred to as a model Middle East democracy. Things that do no good to the people there who actually want a functioning democracy and have seen it eroded just over the past decade or so. While Turkey is a NATO ally, it's grown increasingly close to modern Tsar Vladimir Putin's Russia. Turkey even has a self-styled modern sultan, Erdogan. He stamps out all voices of dissent among Turks themselves and continues the dark tradition of trampling rights of minorities such as the Kurds. Erdogan not only fancies himself Ataturk reborn, he even cited Adolf Hitler as a model of leadership worth emulating as he consolidated supreme, unquestioned executive power. Like all New Yorkers, I have my fair share of profound and enlightening moments that occurred in taxi cabs. One ride is worth passing along now. Late one night, when I wore a younger man's clothes, as Billy Joel sings in The Piano Man, I sat up front with the driver, and I noted his name printed on the dashboard hack license. As Greeks are wont to do, I asked if he was Greek. The man sighed uncomfortably. In fact, he said, I am a Turk. And with that, he braced himself for a torrent of anger. Maybe he thought I'd leap out of the cab in the middle of the Bowery and run screaming for a policeman. He explained that with so many Greeks in New York, the pain of the genocide is very real. And he finds it aimed at him. He lived in fear of being found out especially every time the government or some imam back home made a new denial or outrage against the Christian community there. This man was an American, and he made this point to me a few times as we passed between the traffic lights. Of course, he loved his homeland, but he was ashamed by the acts of some of his ancestors that had tarred forever relationships with their neighbors in Greece. He longed for the camaraderie he'd known as a young boy in Cyprus, before the agitation and the Turkish invasion, in which my other set of grandparents lost the farm they'd lived on for generations. This cab driver confessed that the closest he could ever come to that taste of home was to go to Astoria, Queens, with its huge Greek population. He had to pretend to be a local. He had to deny his heritage forever concerned that someone would find him out and blame him for the deeds of Turk's past. I tell this story because this interview is not just for the widespread Greek diaspora. So long as there are deniers of genocide, the old wounds will never truly heal, leaving the descendants of perpetrator and victim alike, frozen 100 years ago, in a dark world of smoke, blood, revenge, and hatred. It's not a world I'd like to live in, and it's certainly not a world where I'd want to drive a cab. I'm proud to play that small part in ending the conspiracy of silence against recognizing the Greek genocide. Only by being honest about the crimes of the past can we build a better future. If you've walked through the United States Holocaust Museum, 
You've seen the quote from Adolf Hitler at the very end, smugly confident that the world would turn a blind eye to his plans for mass murder. Who, after all, said the dictator, speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians. The failed painter turned mass murderer didn't mention the genocide of the Greeks, which tragically proves his point. Visit the Greek Genocide Resource Center at greek-genocide.net for more on this topic or to get a hold of Aris. You can also check out my conversation with Lou Urenik about his book, Smyrna, September 1922, The American Mission to Rescue Victims of the 20th Century's First Genocide, published in hardcover as The Great Fire. I know that Aris tries as hard as he can to respond to all the requests for help from people that are seeking to find their roots. It's just not possible for one man to do that, and he's a pharmacist after all, not a genealogist. But fear not, if you go to historyauthor.com, there is a link right on the banner to my wife Catherine's genealogical services, and she can put you in touch with some people, maybe point you in the right direction. You can find Aris on Facebook in addition to his website. And you can find us on Twitter at History Dean, Instagram at The History Author Show, or Facebook.com slash History Author. That's it for this installment of The History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in 